Good afternoon, and thank you for being here. Uh, I, I, instead of uh, Lawrence reading a meaningless bio, I thought I'd just tell you a little something about myself uh, when, when I get started. Uh, I started my career as a developer in IBM when I graduated from university. Uh, at the time, I, I was studying engineering, and then software seems to be the place to go. So I ended up getting a job as a software developer uh, back in 1999. So I'm, I'm old, unlike you guys. Uh, tired most of the time, but and, and throughout my, my journey at IBM, I have, I've had an opportunity to work in many different areas with a lot of different teams. 16 months, all I did was travel around, uh, work with open source developers, introduce technology, uh, code with them, may participate in a couple of projects myself, and that was a, a lot of fun, and it's fun to be back here. I don't get to do uh, as many community-based community events as I, I would like these days. So uh, I thought we'd do something a little lighter after a two session of coding. I know you guys had a Kubernetes session this morning, some of, some of you, and then an uh, uh, AI uh, neural net synthesis type uh, session uh, earlier, just from, from 11 to around 1 o'clock, I think. So I thought we'd do something a little lighter and ask an interesting question. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about AI, robotic, uh, robotic automation replacing human being in their jobs. So the question that I'm putting on the board is, will AI replace developer? Right. Uh, normally, at this point, I probably bring up a photo of like the Terminator and Skynet and say, you know, they're coming, we've got to defend ourselves. Uh, but I thought I would do this. Uh, U.S. patent number 9280157. Anyone know what this is? Any guess? Nope, that's not an IBM patent. Cage for developer? Pretty close, pretty close. So uh, this is a, a, a patent filed by Amazon. So what you're seeing here is a device designed by Amazon to keep the human workers safe in a AI and robotics enabled environment. Okay? Now, they were very quick in the news article to say that we never implemented it. We didn't put a human being inside a cage. Now, uh, for fun, I was downstairs looking at this thinking, man, this is interesting. This is uh, our booth downstairs, if you, if you recognize it. This is the little claw machine. In the claw machine, You've got the merchandise sitting inside the machine, the robot sitting inside the machine, the joystick on the outside, human being gets what they want, and then we walk freely around everywhere. Contrasting with this, the merchandise is outside the cage, the claw and the robots are outside the cage, the joystick is on the inside, and by the way, based on this, based on what I read, I don't think the human operator gets to drive this is sitting on a robotic platform to talk to the other robot so they don't run into each other. So when you want to go somewhere, you, you give the instruction, I want to go there, but it's not under your control. So I'm bringing this up because I think it's, it's kind of interesting to see how pervasive we're expecting automation and AI to be in a very near future. So technology is always taking jobs away from human beings. It's nothing new. Farming, right. 1871, uh, I think over 900,000 uh, of, the, of the working population in England and Wales are agricultural workers, farmers. 2014, that number is around 40,000. 95% of agricultural jobs gone because of automation, automation and irrigation, farming machineries. U.S. Postal Service. Cut 25% of the workforce in the last 10 years because of e-billing and mobile connectivities. Robotics jobs, manufacturing jobs out there today. Um, I think McKinsey in just last year, I believe, or the year before, released a report that says about eight, 800 million jobs worldwide will be gone in the next 10 years or so. In fact, uh, I, I think uh, Price, uh, PricewaterhouseCooper released something similar. 38% of all jobs in U.S. that exist today will be gone by 2030 because of technology. Truckers, this one is it's the most dire. Uh, driverless car, 
right? Everybody knows that that's coming. AI, automation, integrated into one. They figure about 3.1 uh, million out of the 3.8 million jobs in the US today will be gone in the immediate future, in the foreseeable future. That's 85%. Frail workers. Frail workers used to be, they, uh, if you go back uh, as little as uh, uh, maybe 50 years ago, you have about 1.3 million, 1.4 million people in the US working in the railroad to actually ship things around. Today, with all the automation and all the signal system that's in place, there's only uh, about 187,000 of those employees left. They used to ship about 600, 655 billion mi uh, ton miles. So how far do you ship how many tons a year? Now they're shipping 1.85 trillion. Triple capacity with 85% workforce cut. This one, this one's interesting. You know what these guys are? They're computers. Did you know that there's a profession called a computers year, year back? I think some of you are nodding saying, yeah. So NASA, uh, uh, the, 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 the show, the NASA show, uh, uh, Hidden, uh, shoot. That's right. So um, the show is about human beings that are hired by NASA to compute trajectory. They're all gone. 100% of that job is gone. So computers has replaced computers. So begs this question, right? Stephen Hawking thinks that that's going to happen. And over here on the other side uh, is a study conducted by the US uh, Department of Energy at the Oak Ridge uh, lab. Three researchers there actually uh, conducted an academic study and found that they figure by the year 2040, code generated by artificial intelligence will be good enough to replace code written by human. Everybody's looking at me, you, why are you here? <laughs> I hate you. <laughs> uh, but, but let, you know, I'll, I'll get to some of that. Uh, but, you know, so, so let's, let's take a look at, at where programming languages are coming from, where programming actually kind of began. I'll try to, an abridged version or history of programming in it. And, you know, if I miss out any key points, please don't be offended. I don't mean to leave out any major technology. I put this together at 2 in the morning last, last night. So um, the year 1800, Jacquard is a guy that was in weaving fabric. He created a loom that takes a punch card that will allow you to program it to weave a particular pattern on a cloth. First programmable machine out there, if you would, the first computing device invented by this man. Ada Lovelace. First real programmer, right? first person to write very first general purpose uh, uh, algorithm. It was a, a thought idea. It was never compiled and, and actually executed, but she was widely a mathematician, widely accepted as the world's first computer programmers. Moving forward, Alan Turing, 1936, you know, Turing machine, the first, uh, first, if you were one of the very first general pro uh, purpose computing device. Uh, John Backus, right, a few years later, Fortran. First high-level language written to replace punch card. Moving away from talking machine code, but speaking more human-like language. Uh, just a, a couple years later, a few years later, Grace Hopper, um, COBOL. Right, COBOL, those of you who know, very verbose, uh, business-like uh, programming language that's in the mainframe that's still uh, widely in use today, if you can believe. Uh, so there's a little break in the timeline. I'm jumping forward a little bit because a whole bunch of other things started happening after that. Basic got invented. Uh, CC++, Unix, uh, the one that I like, 1994, uh, Rasmus, Lerdoff, PHP. Um, I don't know if anyone did any PHP coding before because I, I had the pleasure of actually meeting Ras uh, Rasmus a, a few times when I was doing the, the open source timeline. And I, I had, had many beers with him, really, really smart guy. So I like that data point in, in particular. Uh, but coming all the way to some of the CC++ work and, and then moving forward to TensorFlow in 19, uh, sorry, 2015, uh, Curious in 2015, Cafe in 2017. Right? These are all the languages. And as you can see, new languages keep popping up. But then the question is, why do we have them in the first place? 
Well, I, I think there are a few obvious reasons, right? One, uh, computers are not really smart enough to understand human language. The ambiguity, the nuances in it is too, too complex. So what do we have to do? We have to invent a simplified dialect so that we can have, we could be basically using small words and short sentences so that a computer can understand the instruction that we give it. So it can do the job that we want it to do. Right. Uh, second aspect, why do we have so many of them? Well, the other aspect of it is that there's changing need in terms of what we want the computer to do. So each of the, one of the language and each set of framework was created to solve a very specific set of problem. Again, with small words and short sentences so that the computer can understand and how to actually process that. It's invented by necessity. And developer is there to actually help regular business convey their requirement to a machine. But then this happened. This was last year. So this is what makes it even more interesting now. Uh, Google Duplex, I'm sure all of you have heard about that one. Right? Last year around May timeframe, uh, CEO uh, Pichai, Mr. Pichai, uh, Google CEO, did a demonstration in May in Google I.O. conference uh, where in, in, the for, in the forum, he showcased Google, Google Duplex talking to a human being who runs a shop. Right? Actually, two recording was play. First one, um, the Google AI went and uh, booked an appointment for a haircut or a hairstyle. I can't remember exactly if it was for a lady. Second one was a um, booking for dinner reservation. Right? If you think back, you know, I mentioned touring. In many ways, everyone looked at that and the whole audience just went, you know, they all went crazy, they all clapped. They thought, hey, we got the Turing test done. The, the imitation game is, is, is there. So, so that's one major piece. It was seamless. It was able to actually understand the nuances of the languages and actually complete the task. It was given a task, it went ahead and did that. Maybe a little lesser known, the other project, I'm from IBM. I do read all, all our own press stuff. Uh, IBM Debater, Project Debater actually was released a month after, in June last year. Um, it, for those of you who may not be familiar, it's a project as an offshoot from right after we won Jeopardy against Ken Jennings. Right, we played Jeopardy against Ken Jennings, and then after that, Im immediately after that, this project was kicked off. Now, what it did is a, it's a simple, uh, uh, I, I would still say it's a narrow AI. Its job is to go and engage in a debate with a human being and actually try to win a debate. So they, 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 during the, the live event, they did two debates, and it's a standard international debate format. Not that I know what that is, but apparently it goes something like, the AI comes up, makes an argument, a human being comes up, make a counter argument, in, so two perspectives being presented. The key part here, though, is the AI is supposed to be listening the whole time. And they, the AI has to form a rebuttal and then a summation. Now, during this process, the audience are the judge. The audience were basic, the, the evaluation criteria is which of the two competitor presented more compelling reason for them to change their mind. It's not that they agree with one or the other. We, it's about how far they shift from their previous uh, uh, decision. If they were on one side of the coin, they referred it the other way, then the winner is the, even though they may not have changed their mind, the winner is still the side that, that, that shifted their opinion the most. And the result was uh, we won one and we lost one. Uh, unfortunately, uh, about a month ago, we lost again. But except this time was against the world champion debater at our event, a live cast, uh, webcast at our event in, in San Francisco. So we did lose, but we, we did uh, uh, compete against the best in, in the world. And the other aspect about that is uh, one of the feedback was the AI was able to, to really use fact to create an argument. What's missing is the empathy aspect wasn't connecting with the audience. Those are some of the feedback that we got. So why all of this, right? This is about natural language programming algorithm directly, if you would, right? So if you, even if you look at the debater example, the opponent, the human being's argument is in fact input 
to a program that needs to generate a, a, a particular rebuttal, right? So it's an outcome that is being asked for at a very high level. Basically, what I'm asking the program to do is argue against me. Listen to what I have to say and argue against what I'm saying, right? And then there, there's this, Bayou, is something that's in uh, Rice University. Anyone familiar with this particular piece of research? This is where the beginning of the end is. This is AI that write codes. It's a deep learning project at Rice University where uh, they, they use a neural, neural network sketch uh, learning capabilities where they look at code pattern of thousands and thousands and tens of thousands of Java files and functions. And then based on a pattern, they start using deep learning to recognize what are the input, what are the output, what are the design pattern that's recurring. And then what it can do now is it can actually allow a human programmer to, to give a high level description of what you need to get done. And it will go create a sketch and then generate the code necessary to complete that task. It will present two or three options back to the user apparently and let the developer decide which one to use. That's kind of the onset of where all of this is going. Um, so a little bit scary. But are we done for? I, I hope not. I don't think so. Here's a, a study um, that's conducted out of the University of Oxford. Likelihood of jobs that will be replaced by a computer. And uh, the blue stuff is us, the, the, the dark blue stuff, that, that's us. And the lower end of the spectrum, the less likely. The higher end, more likely. Okay. Turns out, what we do is not that simple. What you guys do nowadays, I say we, I haven't done any coding for 10 years. I apologize, I sound like, such a, I sound like a, a fraud sitting here saying we. I haven't done any coding in ages. But what you guys do are difficult. It takes creativity, it takes a lot of higher level thought process as well. So if you look at the, the job being replaced, the blue line is virtually a single pixel on, on this graph versus some of the other stuff. Right? If you're a sales rep, which I happen to be, that red guy, look at me. So I should move back to coding. That's why I think this is a good time for me to, for another career change just yet. So turns out it's not that easy. 2040 is a long way off still. Second, new jobs are coming. Here's an interesting fact. Um, in fact, 90% of all jobs, basically in human history, has been taken over by technology already. The fact that AI will start writing code, it will happen. It's, everything else has happened in the past. Technology has taken jobs over in, for as long as, you, you know, for the last 140 years. It will happen again, but here's the part that's interesting. Technology also creates new, new jobs. Right? And as humans, we've always shifted our skills and our day-to-day -day practice to continue. If you think about it, 90% of all jobs in the past has already been taken, and yet we're all sitting here working our collective butts off to make sure that the global economy is running. So, the fact that some of the jobs that we know today is shifting away, it's no big deal. Technology always creates new jobs. Now, how many of you would consider yourself a web developer or a mobile uh, web application developer, or web designer, anybody? One, two, three, okay. Imagine for a second, time travel. You guys fly all the way back to 1991. And somebody come and ask you, what do you do for a living? You tell them, I'm a web designer. I code mobile applications. They'll look at me and go, well, what kind of web do you weave? Because the World Wide Web didn't exist until 1992. So the whole classification of web designer, web application, graphics designer that does all that work, none of those jobs existed in 1991. In fact, uh, Dell did a recent study of their own and so they, they concluded that 85% of all jobs that will exist in two, 2030 hasn't even been invented yet. So that's the, that's the part that I think we can just take a step back and breathe. Because the fact that you guys are here means this. Uh, my, my Latin is terrible, but uh, Cora Imparo means still I am learning. 
Michelangelo said that when he was 87 years old. Right? So you guys are here because you guys are interested in new technology, always sharpening new skills and transforming. So I think one advice, don't ever stop. And the fact that we are in the Lifelong Learning Center or Institute, it's just so fitting that, that that's what we're here for. Right? So keep evolving because you have to anyway. There's nothing new. Second. It's going to be about a partnership between human being and machines. Humans are good at certain things. Common sense. Although it's probably a silly word to use because common sense usually are not that common once we're outside this room. I find you know, most programmers are pretty good at common sense, but most of the other guys out there, I'm not so sure. Uh, common sense, uh, compassion, dreaming, abstraction, and generalization. Those are two elements that is critical if you think about what we do. What are machines good at? Eh, learning new languages. The truth is, in the very new future, the computer will speak you know, 38 languages seamlessly, and you, we will struggle to speak one, for me anyway. I struggle to speak one, and my, my French is, is, uh, is non-existent, uh, and my, my, my wife makes fun of my Chinese. So, uh, Natural language is a big one. Pattern recognition, unlimited capabilities in terms of recognizing patterns, remembering things. So there's a, a little bit of a marriage that's going to happen here. I think we all heard this before, right? So how do you actually match the two things together so that we continue to be relevant in this new AI-based economy? Uh, it's going to be about this partnership, so I'll move that forward. Here's a bit of a, a study that I found in KD Nuggets last night around 3 a.m. I'm reading away going, da 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 And uh, there's a little bio that, that's there that you can find out. Um, the, the article is interesting. Um, your AI skills worth less than you think. It's again one of these challenging titles. That's, that's how I came across it because I was preparing for this talk. Um, one of the things that, that was found though is this. Um, the author actually tested two models. Uh, he, the, the author actually worked in Google, uh, was part of the team that tinkered around with, uh, with TensorFlow uh, and so on. And uh, he was playing around with two models, one that he, th he deemed to be better, one that he deemed to be worse. And he started training this model. And that's the accuracy performance between the two. And one of the things that he came, came to realize is that deep skills in coding, the fact that you're building a better model, is much less relevant than good data. So the fact that code is being generated is not a big problem. You need good data to create good machine learning models. In fact, he's noticed that if you train the bad model with like 30,000 or something like 30 or 40,000 uh, 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 data point versus a good model with 30,000 data point, the one, the bad model you train with more data is going to perform better. So one thing that you can do in this space, I think, is the, the piece that I mentioned about before uh, on, on abstraction and generalization. We as human curate data set for machine learning to happen. That curation is not going to change. You, you know, at least I, I'm not seeing algorithm that says the curation is going to be automated in a way that, that in a meaningful way. There's some work being done in that space, but I think we're going to continue to play a big role. We will be actually the teacher of these AI capabilities, and we'll be making that generalization judgment call to help AI because you need good data to create good AI and some of that decision is really not so easily programmed right because the, the truth is there's no context when deep learning happens there's a bunch of ones and zeros and pattern recognitions if you gives it the wrong sets of ones and zeros it's going to come up the wrong pattern right uh, I think the new role of the developers becomes one where you are the collaborator, the orchestrator, the conductor, uh, and the supervisor. And more and more so, you can start to trust generated capabilities. So we ship different products, right? And this is one of the things that we ship, uh, uh, IBM Cloud Private for Data. And there's a few things in here that's interesting. Uh, one uh, is open. We use open source technology. Uh, AI, uh, AI 360, one thing that, uh, that Anoop talked about earlier, something that we open source and we offer for AI fairness. Uh, so we are very much looking at open source capabilities. We do very much spend a lot of time working with uh, different framework like TensorFlow, Cafe, PyTorch, all that will work within this, 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 uh, this framework. 
But the idea is really to start creating trust and transparency. Again, something that, that's a key focus. Part of what we need to do, I think, and this is part of the, the things that a lot of uh, uh, world leader, e Elon Musk and, 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 and Stephen Hawking and various people have spoken out to say that AI is dangerous, right? Okay, uh, I think that's a, sh sure, AI can be dangerous. Anything when mis misused can be dangerous. But I think that's much more, it's more and more critical to monitor, to make sure that you don't, you're not unnecessarily biasing your decision, to make sure that transparency is there. And that's why we invested so much in helping developers that create codes to, to be able to monitor and to be able to make sure that there's trust and compliance and, and that sort of uh, capabilities built in. I think I'm running short on time already. Um, so in other sets, so, so monitoring and then collaborating with teammates, creating uh, AI that you can trust, ethical AI if you would, free of biases or unnecessary biases. I say that because sometimes it's not a bad thing to, to have bias in your model. Well, okay. It is a bad thing to have bias in your model. How many data scientists is in a room? Okay, so bias is, bias is a, so, so the AI term for bias or the, from, it's really about underfitting your, your, your data. So you don't have enough data set to, to create a good model as opposed to overfitting, but, that, but bias is not really a good thing. So you try to make sure it's bias free, right? But explainability and so on. Uh, I think the, I'll, I'll, how many more slides do I got? Oh, okay, I'll just, do this and then I'll jump to the conclusion bit, I think, because uh, interest of time. Um, one of the advice I found that keeps happening in all the readings that I was doing to prepare for this talk is to start looking at how to use AI as a lever for better outcomes. Not necessarily to sell AI, but to use AI to help sell whatever it is that you're selling. Right? That's another key aspect that we, we should be looking at. Uh, there's only it's a very, very small market to create new AI algorithm. It's a very much bigger market to apply those AI into different areas to actually help make money. So if, you, if your plan is to build a better uh, image recognition algorithm, ooh, that boat has sailed. <laughs> that boat has sailed long ago, right? No point doing that. But if your goal is to use existing capabilities to enhance something or use that visual recognition capabilities, uh, tweak it, retrain it to recognize uh, uh, radiology uh, images. That's maybe something different, right? So use it to enhance what you're doing today rather than sell uh, the actual technology itself. And part of that is sometimes to actually leverage tools that you have available to you um, that can help in terms of making it quicker to go to market. So I'm saying since you're not interested in inventing image recognition, don't write it from scratch, right? Use the tools that's available to you. And, and I think Anoop showed you earlier today that uh, new nets is a new capabilities that, that we're, we're providing where for uh, images and speech, you can provide a data set and it will actually do the model generation and all the hyperparameterization tuning for you so that you can have a very accurate deep learning model without you actually writing any code. You can then take it and tweak it even further. That's up to you. But use the tools, use it as a lever. You know, don't make it a research project. Right? Start, start thinking that way. And, and I guess my advice also is kind of, because we keep an eye on some of the, the stuff that's developing, right? Like TensorFlow came out, but TensorFlow was really unusable. So then they wrote this thing called Curus, Curus that actually helps it become usable. So if you're not watching and adopt, uh, adopting and you're just writing TensorFlow, you, you're gonna fall behind. So um, to, to, to stop, right, some of the other stuff that AI can do. Uh, I, I learned something new the other day. This, this, this X thing, IBM X Spotify, that means collab. It means collaboration. It's, it's a cool thing to do these days. Fashion brand does this with like, you know, Supreme T-shirts with like Louis Vuitton purses or something. So IBM had a collaboration with Spotify to write, to help write music. So you think AI is a, th is, you know, it's, it's writing program. Well, AI is actually writing music. So in this case, this is something that you can actually uh, go and have a listen when, when you have a moment. Uh, we actually use AI to help uh, a music producer compose a song by studying musical composition and then 
matching that with um, sentiment analysis on social, uh, social data set, we're, the, the AI is basically able to suggest what type of composition evoke what kind of emotion in the listener. They did the same thing with uh, 20,000 songs and the Billboard top, top 100 for lyrics. So what kind of words in what combination creates what kind of emotion? Then the music producer, Alex the Kid, I don't know who that is, um, just, wrote, just basically asked, similar to a programmer that I mentioned before in, in Bayou, uh, sending in a high level requirement, he sends in an emotion to try to, to, to evoke and actually come, the, the AI actually come back with sample compositions, sample words to be used as a, as a collaboration between AI and human being. Now, uh, pretty easy to kind of take that extension and go, well, how's that, what does that mean to evolving job or evolving job market? How, how's that changing uh, the, way, the way we work? Uh, maybe, right, the year 2040 comes along. Maybe you no longer have music producer or DJ. Maybe the new job title of music producer involve you creating a uh, genetic al algorithm that generate music. And maybe you create two or three or four of these AI bots and you get them to work together to generate music 24 seven. Maybe that's what, make, that's what it means to be a musician 25 years from now. So maybe there's a whole new thing that hasn't happened yet. I mean, the whole concept of DJs and, mus and DJs as, as musicians, David Guerra, all these guys. Think back 40 years, 50, 45, 50 years, a DJ is just some guy sitting on a radio spinning records. DJ today is a superstar. It's nothing that says that, that a programmer who are no longer programming basic algorithm wouldn't be sitting out there creating AI and neural network algorithm that generate music and you may be the next music superstar. Who knows, right? Uh, so with that, I'll stop because uh, I'm already over time. Lauren's looking at me saying, get the heck off of the stage. Uh, I hope this was too boring for you and, and lighten up your afternoon a little bit. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Kitman. Uh, we have time for a question, maybe, somebody? Thank you, uh, very interesting. Uh, I guess, my thinking around this is around so this narrow AI versus general AI, right? I mean, will will AI replace programmers is really a question of is it open, is it general AI, general intelligence or narrow intelligence? Because narrow AI is essentially an optimizer, I mean, yeah. right? So, it, I think it, it's still a narrow AI use case, right? Right. Yeah, so so I guess the question to whether whether AI will replace programmers is yeah. is more of creativity and you know intention and exactly. Right? So I, I think it's that uh, you you're right on. I think it's the fact that it's a, the collaboration that that yields a more powerful team. Yeah. Right. Today, it's no different than let's say today you use an IDE to improve your uh, to improve your productivity. Tomorrow, that IDE will have AI elements in it that allows you to be the the person that orchestrate that compose that that direct what happened as opposed to the person who write the line, line the individual lines of code. Yeah. So, uh, they, so uh, the, to short answer, I think it's a narrow AI that helps instead of replace. So then what is IBM doing in the, in the realm of general AI? I mean, how, and how, I mean, maybe it's beyond your scope, but mm. how, how do you then think about AI becoming a general AI? that is more capable, like, you know, essentially enhancing the, the capabilities yeah. of AI to a quantum level. So, uh, you brought up quantum, that's an interesting one as well. Because uh, we do, we are actually working on some quantum computing capabilities and who knows what that will, uh, what that will, will bring. Um, IBM research has been a driving force, if you would, behind much of the AI technology as well as various advancements. In terms of things that we, that I have seen coming to market, our focus is still in narrow AI. Um, I, I think from a general AI perspective, what I can see is more research around the necessary hardware to advance that forward uh, to, to make it a, a viable use case. Today, I, I, my personal belief is that today, general AI is not really hasn't been quite all that successful in, in, in creating computer to, to be a general AI. Uh, as part of it is compute related. So the, the research I've seen are things like uh, 
uh, neurosynaptic uh, chipset, for example, that increases the, the, the compute density to a point where maybe we can start tackling that problem set. So that there's a whole set of research under the DARPA initiative right now uh, to create, uh, I think the, the, late, the tested latest one has uh, 4,096 cores on a single chip uh, running on like one-tenth the power. Right, the idea is to create something that mimics the human synapse to, to allow uh, uh, high density compute, and that compute may one day create general AI, and, and that they uh, probably come sooner than we think. Uh, in fact, uh, I talked about Stephen Hawking way too much because he, he's kind of passed away last year, and, but Stephen Hawking's actually, one of his quote is that at a, at a, at a, at a certain level, he believes that there's really no fundamental difference between a biological versus a uh, electronics computer in terms of ability to, to mimic uh, uh, human, in, human uh, thought process, if you would. So, so I, I think it will come. I, I don't think it's there yet. But the research that we're doing right now, I think primarily around hardware that I can see. But then, uh, you know, I don't know what they do all the time. They close the door and don't let me in. Thank you so much. Thank you. Apologies for being over.